and the Ford Research Reactor at the University of Michigan. Combined with time he worked with the Navy and DOE, he has more than 30 years of experience in the fields of nuclear, reactor, nuclear reactors and environmental management. Okay, having done those introductions, I would now like to turn things over to Bruce to get the presentation fully underway. Thank you, Neil. Before we discuss the NRC's overall decommissioning process, let's review the Nuclear Energy Innovation and Modernization Act, Section 108 assignments, and the actions the NRC has taken to comply with the law. The law was issued in, on January 14, 2019. Section 108 requires a report identifying best practices for the establishment and operation of local, com local community advisory boards, or CABs, for decommissioning nuclear power plants, including lessons learned from such organizations. A report is due to the Congress by July 14, 2020. The actions were assigned to the reactor decommissioning branch in NMSS. A Federal Register notice soliciting the request for public meetings to discuss CAP best practices was issued March 18, 2019. The public meeting locations were determined in June 2019, and that would be clearance for a questionnaire associated with CAP best practices and lessons learned should be available next week on our website. Next slide. As Neil mentioned, as Part of the reasoning for conducting this webinar is to provide an opportunity for inter any interested parties to provide feedback and input on the NEMA Section 108 Best Practices Report, no matter whether they are able to attend the scheduled public meetings or not. There is significant public interest in the topic of CABs. Only a limited number of local public meetings can be held in the vicinity of, of decommissioning plants. We believe this webinar offers the opportunity to participate for those areas where the meetings will not be held. This webinar also helps inform local communities in advance of upcoming public meetings and is an additional means to gather feedback from stakeholders on CAB best practices. Next slide, please. However, if you are interested in attending one of NEMA Section 108 public meetings near a decommissioning or soon to be decommissioned nuclear power plant, the tentative schedule is listed here. Some of the meeting details and logistics are finalized, but most, most up-to-date information is available on the NEMA, sec NEMA Section 108 public website listed on this slide. Next page, please. As shown on this map, the public meetings will be held in locations that, are, that ensure geographic diversity across the United States, with priority given to states that, one, have a nuclear power plant currently undergoing the decommissioning process, and registered and requested a public meeting under the provisions of NEMA in accordance with the Federal Register Notice published March 18, 2019. Now I will turn it over to Kim to discuss the overall decommissioning process. Thanks, Bruce. Before we, el we elaborate on the decommissioning process, we thought it would be useful to provide a simple definition of the goal of decommissioning. As we state on this slide, the NRC's overarching objective is to ensure any residual radioactivity is within federal limits, so that the site may be released for unrestricted use in the future. So how does the decommissioning process actually work? The NRC requirements are designed to protect workers and the public throughout the decommissioning process and the public and the environment after the plant's license is terminated. The NRC has strict rules governing nuclear power plant decommissioning and the storage of spent nuclear fuel. The NRC communicates with the public during the decommissioning process in many ways, including publicly available licensing documents and inspection reports, public meetings, congressional briefings, and updates to state and local government officials. The NRC also strongly encourages the creation of community advisory boards, or CABs, to enhance the free flow of information about decommissioning activities between the licensee, local officials, and the public. We will talk more about the establishment of CABs, as well as those boards already in existence later in the presentation. Even before a plant shuts down, activities are ongoing that will help with the decommissioning process. While operating, the licensee maintains records important to decommissioning, such as financial records, records related to ra radioactive spills and material history of the site, annual reports of plant operations, and radiological environmental monitoring reports. Additionally, once the licensee has decided to permanently cease operation, 
other planning activities begin, including identification and selection of a decommissioning strategy, which we'll discuss later, and site characterization. The licensee can also prepare and submit a decommissioning planning document called the Post-Shutdown Decommissioning Activities Report, or PSDAR, before the plant shuts down. There are several steps that take place in conjunction with the permanent shutdown of a U.S. nuclear power plant. These steps are spelled out in the NRC regulations. Once the reactor has been operated for the last time, the plant owner must first submit to the NRC a written certification of the permanent cessation of operations within 30 days of the decision to not continue operations. Next, when the nuclear fuel has been permanently removed from the reactor vessel, the owner must submit another written certification to the NRC. Once these notifications have been made, by law, the company is not authorized to reload fuel into the reactor vessel and operate the plant. To operate the plant again, the owner would need to apply for a new operating license. Prior to or within two years of permanent, cessation or permanent shutdown, um, the NRC requires the submittal of the plant's PSDAR, which provides a general overview of the proposed decommissioning activities and schedule, as well as the associated costs. This slide contains more information on the details that should be found in the plant's PSDAR. The purpose of the PSDR is to provide the NRC and the public with a general overview of the company's proposed decommissioning activities. It is also designed to inform the NRC staff of expected activities, which will help guide the agency's oversight. The estimated costs for decommissioning are also included in the report, as well as an affirmation that the decommissioning and dismantlement activities can be completed consistent with the site's existing environmental report. Since the PSDAR only provides information on the plan for decommissioning the plant and is not a federal action, the NRC does not explicitly approve the report. As with any report made to the NRC, we review the PSDAR to determine if it meets our regulatory requirements. The NRC will review the PSDAR within 90 days of receipt to confirm that the licensee's planned decommissioning activities will not foreclose the release of the site for possible unrestricted use, result in significant environmental impacts not previously reviewed, or result in there no longer being reasonable assurance that adequate funds will be available for decommissioning. Following the submittal of the PSDAR, the licensee must notify the NRC before performing any decommissioning activity inconsistent with the actions and schedules described in the PSDAR, including changes that significantly increase the decommissioning costs. During the NRC's review of the PSDAR, we publish a notification in the Federal Register to inform the public of the receipt of the PSDAR and to solicit comments. The NRC also hosts a public meeting in the vicinity of the decommissioning nuclear plant, typically within 90 days of receiving the PSDAR, to collect further feedback on the decommissioning plan outlined in the PSDAR. As a slide notes, the plant's owner can commence major decommissioning work, such as starting to dismantle plant components, 90 days after the PSDAR is received by the NRC. There are different courses of action for plant owners as they plan for decommissioning. <clears throat> They may decide to pursue immediate dismantlement, which are referred to as the DECON alternative. Under DECON, structures and equipment related to nuclear power production are decontaminated and removed. Once the demolition and decontamination work is completed, the court would need to demonstrate that any remaining radioactivity meets the criteria for unrestricted release of the property. Another option for plant owners is placing the facility in storage for a period of time and then proceeding with dismantlement and cleanup work at a future date. This alternative is referred to as safe store, and involves preparing the structures for long-term storage and then monitoring them throughout the storage period. Preparations for safe store would include draining pipes and pumps, de-energizing electrical systems, and securing various structures. Plant owners may also use a combination of safe store and decon. As an example, they may do some dismantlement work or abandon systems in place not long after the plant permanently shuts down, then put the facility in storage for many years before resu resuming the remainder of the deconstruction. Again, confirmatory surveys of any remaining radioactivity would need to be performed once the dismantlement work is eventually completed. Keep in mind that it takes many years to construct the power plant, and decommissioning a nuclear power plant typically takes about seven to ten years. Another way to think of it is a giant deconstruction project with miles of cables and pipes and tons of materials hauled away. Under the NRC's regulations, nuclear power plant decommissioning must be completed within 60 years. Keep in mind this refers to the portions of the site that were used for nuclear power production and do not involve, for example, returning the entire site property to greenfield condition. 
The basis for the 60-year timeline is this, 50 years in safe store to allow radioactive decay of the shorter-lived radioactive materials plus 10 years of radiological decommissioning work to terminate the NRC license. It is not uncommon for greenfielding to occur after the termination of the NRC license, such as with the main Yankee site shown at the bottom of this slide. At the top of the slide is a photo that Bruce took at Rancho Seco in California. The plant was permanently shut down in 1989, and the reactor license terminated in 2009. The owner has not demolished any of the structures and has built two combined cycle generating units at the site to take advantage of the transmission lines of switchyard and the availability of a source of cooling water. I will now turn it over to Zahira to discuss the NRC's continued oversight during decommissioning. Thanks, Kim. When a reactor ceases operation, the NRC's work to ensure safety and security continues. Specifically, NRC ensures through a continuing oversight process that operational safety control, security measures, and emergency preparedness remain sufficient to protect the public health and safety. The NRC's inspection program for the decommissioning of nuclear power plants, as well as the dry fuel storage inspection program, are well-defined and consistent. These programs are outlined in NRC Inspection Manual Chapters 2561 and 2690, respectively. The key objectives of these programs are to verify that the spent fuel is being safely and securely stored, decommissioning activities are being conducted safely, and site operations and license termination activities are performed in accordance with federal regulations. When carrying out these programs, our key focus is on safety and security. The NRC decommissioning inspection program ensures that appropriate oversight continues after safe plant shutdown and removal of the spent fuel from the reactor. Specifically, the reactor decommissioning inspection manual has procedures designated as core, which are required to be performed annually, and once listed as discretionary, which are performed as needed based on activities and or issues at the site. I want to emphasize that oversight inspections and monitoring are performed perform throughout the decommissioning process. During this inspection, the NRC verifies that controls and methods for the safe storage of radioactive material, including site structures and equipment, are being maintained in accordance with regulations and license commitments. In addition, NRC inspector will be on hand for major work activities at the site, and at least once per year. Examples could include the demolition of a major structure, the removal of a significant component such as a reactor vessel, and the transfer of, of the spent fuel from the plant spent fuel pool to a dry cast storage. The NRC can take enforcement actions against the plant owner should violation be identified during these activities. Now we would like to address questions that frequently come up in regard to managing the spent fuel during and, after, during and after the decommissioning and our review and oversight of those activities. The most asked question is what becomes of the spent fuel nuclear fuel that's behind from the plant's operation. And the correct answer is that in almost all cases, it is removed from the spent fuel pool to be stored on site in a dry cast storage installation often called an independent spent fuel storage installation, or SSC, until an interim or long-term disposal solution is available. At all nuclear sites with SSCs, the cast sit on a reinforced concrete pad in the protected area of the plant. The cast themselves are robust storage units approved by the NRC for, the use, for use throughout the nuclear industry. Typically, the fuel sits in a stainless steel stainless steel cast that is surrounded by a thick concrete overpass. Vents at the bottom and at the top allow for convective air flow to keep the fuel cool. The NRC inspector who is specialized in stainless steel and storage are on hand when the SPC pad is and Another question we receive with some frequency is if the plant stent fuel pool remains safe during the commission. And the answer is yes, all stent fuel pools are safe. Stent fuel pools are typically 40 or more feet deep with at least 20 feet of water covering the stent fuel pool 
to provide safety and allow for fuel assemblies to be moved with, while, the, while submerged. The walls of the pool of the pools are typically four to six feet thick, with a steel reinforced concrete and a steel liner. The pools are located in the most secure areas of the plant, which are protected by armed guards and physical barriers. In addition, once the fuel is placed in the central pool, it cools off relatively quickly, which further reduces the risk posed by the spent fuel over time. Spent fuel pools in uh, U.S. nuclear power plants are designed to withstand all credible severe natural, re natural events, including floods, tornadoes, earthquakes, tsunamis, and hurricanes. Spent fuel pool safety is ensured by maintaining a sufficient level of cooling water above the fuel, even during accident conditions. Under all conditions, public health and safety are ensured by strictly regulated design features and operational practices. So how are changes made for nuclear power plants once they are in the decommissioning process? Typically, this is done via license amendments and exemptions requests from the plant owners, which outline the technical, regulatory, and safety basis for the desired changes. The energy reviews and must explicitly approve these requests before the proposed change can be made. The NRC can also issue orders to direct plant owners to take safety or security actions. This process is designed for operating and decommissioning nuclear power plants. Looking ahead, the NRC is in the process of developing new regulations in the area of decommissioning. The draft version of those regulations is now under review with completion expected in 2021. An overarching goal of this regulation is to create a more standardized approach when it comes to decommissioning activities. We could do a whole separate webinar on what upcoming changes may entail, but that said, there is a significant amount of information on the proposal on our website, and we will be willing to share more information with those interested in the topic. Now I will turn over to Ted to talk about the steps of decommissioning and the different approaches being used to accomplish those steps. Thanks, Zahira. Now that we've discussed the regulatory and oversight changes that the plan owners and the NRC make as the facility enters decommissioning, it's time to talk about the physical steps to dismantle and decontaminate the plant. There are several phases in the decommissioning process. This graphic shows, in a generic sense, the way those phases play out. The phases include initial activities, major decommissioning and storage, and license termination activities. We already discussed the initial activities that occur after a plant has permanently shut down, but before any dismantlement work gets underway. But to reiterate, when the plant permanently shuts down, the owner must submit a written certification to that effect to the NRC within 30 days. When the nuclear fuel is permanently removed from the reactor vessel, the owner must submit another certification to the NRC. That submittal signals that the owner has surrendered authority to operate the reactor or load fuel into the reactor vessel. This eliminates the obligation to adhere to certain requirements needed only during reactor operations, such as maintenance requirements for systems no longer used. The plant owner will prepare the plant for decommissioning. This will involve de-energizing and securing certain plant systems, performing site modifications, and usually moving all spent fuel into dry cask storage systems. De-energizing and securing systems can include draining liquids out of vessels, valves, and piping, and de-energizing electrical components. Systems and equipment needed for spent fuel storage and handling will remain intact. Prior to or within two years of permanently shutting down the plant, the owner must submit the post-shut decommissioning activities report to the NRC. That PSDAR may be submitted prior to the plant shutting down, but it must be submitted within two years after shutdown. With respect to actual decommissioning and dismantlement work, the owner can initially use up to 3% of its set-aside funds for decommissioning planning activity. Then, 90 days after the NRC has received the PSDAR, the owner can begin major decommissioning activities without specific approval. These activities include permanent removal of major components such as the reactor vessel, steam generators, large piping systems, pumps, and valves. During this process, low-level radioactive waste may be shipped to an approved disposal facility. 
The NRC DOES criteria for unrestricted release of a nuclear power plant site once decommissioning work has been completed is less than 25 millirems per year to an average member of the public and radioactivity removed to as low as reasonably achievable, or ALARA. The company may seek the unrestricted release of unaffected portions of the site as they become available before all site decommissioning work is completed. But in order to do that, the plan owner must request permission from the NRC and a public meeting must be held in the vicinity of the nuclear plant to discuss the proposed partial site release. Such releases of portions of sites have occurred at numerous operating and decommissioning plants, all subject to approval by the NRC. Near the end of the decommissioning process, the plant's owner is required to submit a licensed termination plan. This is within two years of requesting the expected termination of the license. The plan must address each of the following. Site characterization, remaining site dismantlement activities, plans for site remediation, detailed plans, final radiation surveys for release of the site, updated estimates of remaining decommissioning costs, and a supplement to the environmental report describing any new information or significant environmental changes associated with the final cleanup. The license termination plan requires NRC approval via license amendment. Before approval can be given, an opportunity to provide comments or request a hearing is published and a public meeting is held near the plant to solicit public feedback. Any remaining dismantlement, remediation, and radiological survey work will be performed in accordance with the license termination plan. As part of the inspection process, the NRC will conduct confirmatory radiological surveys and sampling to verify the licensee's decommissioning results. The NRC typically uses a third party to independently conduct the confirmatory surveys. When the licensee's radiological surveys demonstrate that the facility and site meet the applicable criteria, that they're suitable for unrestricted release, and the NRC has confirmed this through a review of survey reports, independent inspections, and confirmatory surveys, then the NRC issues a letter terminating the operating license. To date, all decommissioning plans have committed to releasing the site for unrestricted use, meaning the radioactivity would be below the NRC's limits of 25 millirems of annual exposure and a lot, and there would be no further regulatory controls by the NRC. States can establish their own release criteria based on property ownership or state permits, but those criteria are not part of the site's NRC license. So using the process just discussed, the NRC has gained extensive experience with the decommissioning of nuclear power plants, including 11 facilities that are currently in active decommissioning. 11 other plants are in safe store, which, as we explained earlier, means they've been placed in a safe, stable condition and are being maintained by their owners, pending dismantlement work in the future. Four of the 11 plants in active decommissioning are expected to complete the license termination process by the end of 2020. Some examples of plants that have previously completed the decommissioning process are Yankee Row in Rome, Massachusetts, Maine Yankee in Wiscasset, Maine, Connecticut Yankee in Haddam, Connecticut, and Big Rock Point in Michigan. The only NRC regulated facilities remaining at these sites are the independent spent fuel storage installations, or ISFCs. Although the NRC's traditional decommissioning process has been used with success by many nuclear plants, recently new business models are being implemented that give plant owners additional options and flexibility in completing the dismantlement and remediation of the facilities. All of these models are subject to the same NRC rules and requirements, but represent different methods for plant owners to leverage decommissioning resources from outside companies. So in one, the utility self-performs. They, they manage a decommissioning contractor. Examples would be Humboldt Bay and San Onofre. In another model, the utility transfers the licensee to a decommissioning company, and the land and spent fuel are transferred back. Examples would be Zion and La Crosse. And finally, in the third model, the utility sells the plant to a company who will decommission the plant and manage the spent fuel. Examples are Vermont Yankee, Western Creek Pilgrim, and there are others who have announced similar approaches. The NRC does not promote one decommissioning business model over any other, 
that does conduct detailed technical and regulatory reviews to establish the ability of decommissioning companies to complete site dismantlement and remediation activities in lieu of the plant owner. This includes a financial review and validation, as well as a technical competency review. These reviews are conducted as part of the license for process, in which the operating license for the decommissioning plant is transferred to a decommissioning company to complete the license termination process. I'm now going to turn us back over to Bruce to talk about community involvement in the decommissioning process and the requirements of the NEMA law itself. Thanks, Ted. First, we'd like to point out that there are already multiple opportunities for public participation in the decommissioning process. For example, each license amendment request, including the license transfer Ted just discussed, allows for an opportunity to provide public comment and request a hearing. The NRC also conducts public meetings in the vicinity of decommissioning nuclear power plants to discuss PSDR uh, contents, partial site releases, and license termination plans. The NRC, NRC staff are also frequently invited to speak on decommissioning topics at state and local government hearings, meetings, and other events, and routinely participate as guest presenters at existing community advisory board meetings. Which finally brings us to the topic at hand for today's webinar, best practices and lessons learned from community advisory boards at decommissioning nuclear power plants. So what is a community advisory board? While there is no one size, no one size fits all models, all model for decommissioning caps, some of the general tenets of such organizations are listed on this slide. We should also point out that the caps may have differing names such as community engagement panels or citizens advisory board or something similar. As mentioned, while the NRC does not have the authority to direct anyone to sponsor or participate in the decommissioning process, for many years we have recommended that power plant licensees be involved in decommissionings, form a community committee or other advisory organization aimed at fostering communication and information exchange between the licensee and the members of the community that the decommissioning may affect. <clears throat> As we will see on another slide, this practice has yielded good results at several facilities. Okay. Just as there are no one size that fits all composition for decommissioning caps, neither is there a single set of topics for each board to consider as the plant as the plant is, is associated with progresses through the decommissioning process. Instead, our observations and experience have, be, have been that each decommissioning cabs adapts to the specific concerns of the community and region where the decommissioning is taking place. Topics whose level of interest varies between the sites, including transportation of radioactive waste, the socioeconomic implant, impact of the plant being shut down, and the interim and long-term storage plans for the storage of spent nuclear fuel. By engaging, actively engaging the community in obtaining local citizens' views and concerns regarding the decommissioning process and, and, de and spent fuel issues. Licensees can better understand and consider these views, maintain better relations with local citizens, and local communities can be kept informed of the decommissioning process. If the CAB is formed, Early in the decommissioning process, the CAB provides an organized forum in which the, de the licensee serves the community by providing information on the decommissioning plans and activities. And the local community can provide feedback to the licensee and state officials on the plans for dismantling, demolition, and dose right criteria and dose criteria and waste transportation. While site restoration is not an NRC concern once the license is terminated, the CAB can provide important input to the licensee on what the site will look like after all of the radioactive material is removed and the future reuse of the site. As I already mentioned, the concept of a decommissioning cab is not new. Versions of these organizations existed at many of the earliest nuclear power plants to enter decommissioning. The experience gained and lessons learned from prior decommissioning projects have, well been, have been well documented by the nuclear industry. In 2005, the Electric Power Research Institute, or EPRI, published the Maine Yankee Decommissioning Experience Report, 
in this lessons learned report, the, the nuclear industry recognized that engaging the local community and officially forming a CAB is a good practice. Specifically, the EPRI report states that the CABs can provide an important window for the public in the process of decommissioning and provide the opportunity for issues of local concern to be addressed both written within and without a, the strict process defined by the regulations. This brings us to today, where CABs exist at, a, at the majority of decommissioning nuclear power plants. Although with many different compositions and many forms, depending on such factors as the CAB sponsor, state requirements, and topics of highest interest. The staff, NRC staff acknowledges the desire for and value of community involvement in decommissioning of a nuclear power plant. Power plant decommissioning is a complex project, and the NRC believes that the impact of decommissioning and termination of a nuclear power plant reactor license needs to be communicated to the local community. We have also observed that the com that community interest in nuclear de in reactor decommissioning activities can de can vary de can vary depending on the location and historic relationship between the licensee and the state and local governments, local labor unions, and members of the public and other stakeholders. As an independent safety regulator, the NRC ensures that all members of the public are given a fair and an equal opportunity to comment on the licensee's decommissioning plans through the license amendment process. The NRC sponsored public meetings and other forums. Therefore, the NRC does not officially recognize or endorse any specific special interest group, public or private organization, community groups, coalitions, or individuals. This approach ensures that one or more organizations do not, do not dominate a public forum and allows members of the public to provide alternative and differing viewpoints and comments to the NRC. Next slide. And now finally it's time to talk about the Nuclear Energy Innovation and Modernization Act and pull together all the information we have discussed regarding decommissioning and community advisory advisory boards, how these all these things may be important for the NRC to fulfill its obligations under the NEMA legislation. NEMA directs the NRC to submit a report to Congress identifying best practices for establishment and operation of local community advisory boards and associated, associated with nuclear power, with power plants decommissioning activities, including lessons learned from existing boards. As a part of developing this report, the NRC is hosting this webinar and 11 public meetings to consult with state, host states, communities within the emergency planning zone of a nuclear power plant and existing local cabs. At these meetings, we hope to have a have com comments on best practices and lessons learned associated with the CABs at the decommissioning nuclear power reactors. The results of these meetings, along with any data received as a result of the NRC's other information collection activities, will be captured in the best practices report. The contents of this report will include a description of the type of topics that could be brought before a CAB, how the board's input could inform the decision-making process for stakeholders or for various decommissioning activities, how the board would interact with the NRC and, and other regulatory bodies to promote dialogue between the licensee and affected stakeholders, how the board could offer opportunities for public engagement throughout the phases of the decommissioning process, a discussion of the composition of the existing community advisory board and a, a practice and best practices identified during the establishment and operation of such boards, including logistical considerations frequencies of meetings in the process of selection of board members, et cetera. In addition to hosting several public meetings to discuss best practices and lessons learned associated with the decommissioning CABs, the NRC is issuing a questionnaire to solicit information from stakeholders on the topics that NEMA Section 108 requires to be included in the report to Congress. This questionnaire will be available very soon on NRC's NEMA Section 108 public website, and hard copies will be distributed during the upcoming public meetings. The questionnaire questions are captured on the next few slides, and we welcome any initial feedback or comments on the CAB best practices when we get to the open discussion portion of the webinar. Any inter interested persons may also submit a written response to the NEMA Section 108 uh, questionnaire using the response methods as shown on a few slides from now. In addition, please feel free to distribute the questionnaire 
and any information about the agency's activity in response to Section 108 of NEMA that you feel is relevant to any interested stakeholders in your area. The questions on this slide are focused on cab logistics, the procedures for cabs, and how the cab operates, including how board member input is used to inform decision making for stakeholders in the licensee. And it includes why is the local cab established, how and when was the local cab established, is there a charter, what is the historical and current, current frequency of cab meetings, what is historical and current composition of a local cab, and what is the selection process for board members, their terms, the specific rules and protocols that the CAB follows, any specific logistics required to support the CAB meetings and other activities, and how the board's input is used to inform decision-making process of stakeholders for the decommissioning process. Here's the second half of the NEMA Section 108 questions. These questions are focused on CAB operations, what the topics are discussed, and what opportunities for the members of the public to engage in these discussions? What interactions does the CAB have with regulators? Such questions as who sponsors the CAB expenses? What kinds of activities are included in the budget? What topics have been or could be brought before a CAB? What other topics may be useful, could be useful to stakeholders understanding the decommissioning process? what interaction with local CAB and have with the NRC and other regulatory bodies, how does the CAB offer opportunities for public engagement throughout all the phases of the decommissioning process. In general, what are the, the advantages of having a local CAB? And in general, what are the disadvantages of having a local CAB? Here are the final questions along with some questions. Here are the final questions along with some questions from decommissioning plants where CABs have not been established. Has the licensee or state ever considered the establishment of local CAB? Was it considered? What are the reasons for not establishing a CAB? How does the licensee or state provide opportunities for public engagement throughout the decommissioning process? And in general, what are the advantages and disadvantages of the CAB or not, of not having a local, of a local CAB? So now that we have talked through the topics required to be in the NRC's best practices report and gone over the specific questions we came up with, uh, we came up with to try and capture the information for decommissioning cabs, all that remains is to ask you to provide feedback to us on these issues. Obviously, we'll be taking notes and soliciting feedback during today's webinar, but there are also several other ways to provide comments as outlined on this side, slide. Receiving stakeholder feedback and ensuring that this request for information reaches the maximum number of affected persons is very important to those of us working to implement the requirements of NEMA Section 108. I hope that we will have a productive discussion today and that the folks will take the time to fill out all or portions of the NEMA questionnaire to make sure that the NRC has a good cross-section of decommissioning CAD data from which to draw our conclusions for the NEMA Congressional Report. Electronics will be available, submills will be available in a few days. We do some information clearing requirements we are just fitting up. Uh, your feedback, again, is very important to us. And we want to thank you on the behalf of the NEMA 108 section, work, section Working Group for taking the time to attend this webinar and share your perspective on best practices and lessons learned from decommissioning cabs. And now I'll turn it back over to Neil. Okay, uh, thank you to all of our presenters, and we are getting close to the question and answer section of the webinar. Before we transition to the discussion portion, I wanted to provide you with a couple of additional decommissioning information resources. This slide shows you the, the numerous sources of NRC information on decommissioning, spent fuel storage, and more. They can be found on our public webpage at www.nrc.gov by looking under the radioactive waste tab. I would also recommend our YouTube videos on decommissioning, which are also available on the public website. Next is a, a page that provides the links to several guidance documents and other information resources related to the decommissioning process. As for this presentation, it is already available via the page on our website containing the notice for this webinar. 
If you go to our main web page, again, which is www.nrc.gov, and click on, the, click on August 8th on the calendar, you will be able to access that page and see the slides. Should you have any further questions or comments on the NEMA Section 108 webinar, please do not hesitate to contact our Public Affairs Office. The, com the contact information can be found on this slide, and the NEMA Section 108 Working Group is available via the listed resource email. We have been receiving questions and comments electronically throughout this presentation, and we will get to those in just a moment. However, before we do that, there is another separate request we would like to ask, ask of you to make sure we uh, get the proper feedback on this webinar. There will be an easy way to provide feedback. If you go to the meeting notice for the session, on, again, on the NRC Public website, there is a simple form you can fill out to provide feedback about how we've done communicating during this webinar and what we can do to, to improve going forward. Okay, lastly, again, we want to thank you for your interest and participation in this presentation. We also want to just talk a little bit about some, some ground rules before we get to the Q&A. We would ask that you be concise. Uh, we would ask that you try not to repeat comments or questions that have already been offered. And we, we, we'll try to get to as many comments as we can, but please keep in mind that there are over 300 people registered for this webinar and we have until about 3 o'clock allotted for this. So th there will be a limit as to how many we're able to get to. At the same time, we would point out that there will be opportunities to comment at the upcoming public meetings and in writing. And as for the public meetings, we've noted that there will be a series of these across the country coming up within the next several months. So with that, I'm going to ask Bruce to, to, to uh, try to address some of the written questions we've received as we've been uh, undertaking this webinar and then we'll uh, begin to take some verbal questions. So Bruce, do you want to go ahead and, and begin answering some yes. of Yes, thank you, Neil. Um, the staff has here been looking at your, the comments, written comments as they've been coming in. Uh, we'll start out with a few of those. I do want to mention again that the slides that were presented today are available on the NEMA Section 108 webpage, on page on web, NRC's website. Um, so, as Neil said, there was over 300 people registered. We apparently have 266 people in attendance today on the webinar. So there's, uh, as we said, considerable interest in these web this webinar and, of course, the general topic of citizens' advisory panels. Uh, we have a number of uh, specific questions to CABS, which I am glad we have. Uh, I wanted to note that uh, we are in the process of still, of still scheduling some of the meetings uh, due to availability of specific people we wanted, we've invited to the meetings along with staff availability and along with uh, having venues and contracting those venues. Uh, we still have not, I think, uh, formally scheduled uh, the, the uh, cab meetings at Indian Point, Kiwani, Zion, and uh, I think Crystal River yet. So we're still working on those. Uh, so uh, the other ones should be uh, on the website uh, very soon and the information. Um, one of the questions here is, does the NRC pay for public citizens to be members of the cabs? Uh, and the other question here is, uh, that was, I think, uh, pertinent to that is, are licensees required to participate in CAB meetings? And what does sponsored CAB meeting, CAB mean, CAB mean? Well, let me just start off by saying, uh, first of all, there's generally two types of, of CABs. And by sponsored, I mean they are, they are organized either by the state they're in, by legislation, or by the, the licensee who's decommissioning the nuclear power plants. We consider them the sponsor of the CAB. Uh, since they are uh, sponsored by those entities, uh, there is no reimbursement from the NRC for people to participate in those CABs, and I don't know of any re remuneration uh, from uh, the sponsors, and generally those are volunteer uh, positions that people uh, are asked to participate with the CAB. What are the powers of the CAB? The CAB is there to uh, receive, 
uh, advice from the public in the local vicinity uh, to interface with the local utility. And, of course, I'm sure the members of the CABS may have their own opinions about uh, the decommissioning, which they can also share with the licensee. And, of course, on the reverse side of that, the licensee can share the information with that their, their plans and anticipated schedules uh, of activities that may impact the local community on the decommissioning activities. No, I Uh, one of the questions here is, does the NRC participate in CAB meetings? Uh, I wanted to mention that we, again, that we are an independent safety regulator. Uh, we do not uh, endorse any uh, participation by anybody on these CABs uh, in, in the respect that we are not a participant uh, or member of the CAB. Uh, we maintain our independence by listening to, to the CAB meetings or go attending them. Uh, as I did say, we uh, do uh, participate when, in, when invited as guests to give presentations on specific, specific issues that are related to the power plant decommissioning. All right, Bruce, would you uh, maybe we should start taking some questions from the, from the phone at this point? We will now begin so to question and answer. Yes. Yes, I'm sorry, could please go ahead and queue up the first call, please? Sure. We will now begin the question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1. Our first question comes from Richard Webster. Richard, your line is open and you may ask your question. Hello. So I have two questions. Um, one is specifically about cabs and one is about decommissioning cost estimates. Uh, the cabs question is, how have cabs been hampered by a lack of availability of expert funds and inability to require the licensee to supply requested information? And the cost estimate question is, is it, the, the cost estimates I understand have been coming down for decommissioning but is there any empirical data to support that uh, reduction in cost? Okay, Bruce, uh, would you like to talk about these two, the lack of, first question, whether there's an issue as far as available ex expert ex expertise for the cabs? Um, and then secondly, uh, has the cost been coming down for, for decommissioning projects? Well, I, I would have to say that on the first part, the NRC does not uh, provide any financial support to the CABs in order to hire or uh, contract uh, technical expertise. Uh, we would leave that up to the sponsor of the CAB or whoever runs the CAB if they felt they needed that type of uh, help. Uh, secondly, the, uh, the, as far as decommissioning funding goes, uh, the NRC uh, reviews the decommissioning funds on a uh, standard, which we call reasonable assurance, that they have sufficient funds to complete the decommissioning. Um, obviously, a decommissioning fund is an estimate, and that estimate uh, is based on what the utility is able to collect uh, from uh, the revenues from the uh, authorized by the Public Service Commission. Uh, the actual status of the fund is up to them, uh, but we look at it from a minimal standpoint, uh, is there sufficient funds? And to date, all of the plants that have gone into decommissioning have, have had a reasonable and adequate fund to decommission the plant. Uh, so it, with it being an estimate, uh, it's exactly what it is. Uh, most plants uh, have more than sufficient funds to decommission the plant, uh, at least uh, from our perspective and uh, from a radiological decommissioning uh, standpoint. I would add one other. Um, this is Ted Smith. Um, thought on the um, the cost estimates. So the, some of this is uh, estimate is, is tied to the the new business models, where in their estimates, um, because of better, pl more advanced planning by licensees and transfers, they are um, transitioning into decommissioning quicker, and so there you're seeing some savings from. Um, the, the plant staffing requirements uh, drawing down faster and, and completing dry storage campaigns quicker. And so obviously as you do things faster, there's a, there's a cost savings associated. So I think that's 
one factor that's that, that's affecting that overall number. Thank you for that question. Okay, um, Mr. Webster, are you satisfied with those answers? Um, well, under the caps, that wasn't really an answer. It was really a, uh, it was really a, a statement of fact, right, that they are not funded. My question is, could they? I'm sorry, you're breaking up a little bit there. Sorry. My question is, could the CABs perform better if they did have experts access to expert funds, since you're reviewing what could be rather than what is, right? Well, uh, I'd have to respond to that. That's a rhetorical question, and I don't know that uh, there would be any real benefit from that. Uh, but that that's a rhetorical issue, a theoretical issue that we really can't respond to. It would be a what if. Well, I know, but that's, if, I, let me just say that where, where you're trying to identify how cabs can be improved, you need to do some what-if thinking. Well, I would accept that as a recommendation. Or yeah, the comment I'm, that, okay. I, yeah. I would say, as a, I, I would comment saying, I think having, uh, just like in the in the EPA uh, super fund process, was that the technical assistance tag grants available to, um, to uh, communities because the, the issues are complex and technical, and uh, it's very difficult for lay people to totally understand them without having an expert on their side. And if they have to rely on company expertise, then they only get one, uh, one analysis, which is what the company's already done, rather than a different perspective. So uh, I would suggest that NLC looks at what EPA does in the super fund area and considers whether right. that uh, would be a, a good model. Okay. Well, well thank, thank you for your comment. Yeah. Uh, we're familiar with the EPA uh, grant program. Yeah, but thank, thanks for the comment. We appreciate it. Um, operator, could we have another call, please? Yes. Our next question comes from Alex Carlin. Alex, your line is open, and you may ask your question. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me, Bruce? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, I have, uh, I think, two questions. Um, first, uh, I think I, uh, I, 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 the statute prescribes that, that uh, the year group is to do a best practices for local community advisory boards. So it seems to me there is at least one central and primary function uh, that must be met uh, to be within this uh, scope of this, this survey which is that it is an advisory board, that the primary function of the entity is not merely to promote dialogue or to do public relations or to educate the public, but it is to serve as an advisory board. And I would ask if you have uh, asked that you focus on that as a central criterion as to when you go about evaluating of the various entities that are out there. My second question is, no, noting that we are talking about advisory boards, there is an excellent uh, best practice model uh, available, almost the gold standard, which is the Federal Advisory uh, Committee Act, which NRC is, of course, subject to, and uh, the statute and NRC regulations at 10 CFR uh, Part 7, prescribe, uh, define what an advisory board is, uh, prescribe selection criteria, composi composition criteria, and other criteria which represent, I think, uh, in a significant way the federal government's uh, thoughts as to what constitute, what an advisory board should look like. And although this is not a, we're not talking about federal advisory boards here today, we're talking about local advisory boards. I think the criteria and standards of the FACA uh, are an excellent starting point. So I'd ask you to consider, would you, have you considered FACA? Uh, and um, I think I agree with Mr. Webster that your job is not simply to survey the ex existing boards that are out there, but is to come up with a report that would Con the, tell Congress what the best practices are or and would be for advisory boards. So my two questions are, one, advisory uh, needs to be a central function of the boards you are surveying and the standards you come up with, and 
and not just uh, education, and two, uh, FACA should be used as a model. Uh, do you have, can you tell me if you've thought about those two concepts? Uh, I think we're familiar with both areas, and we are also considering them. So I appreciate your comments. Uh, well, can we go to a couple of the written ones? Yes, let's, let's go to uh, several of the written ones now, and then we'll go back to the phone. All right. Uh, one of the, a good question here is, is there a deadline to comment or submit questions on the website for the CABS? Uh, we are, are currently going to be requesting feedback uh, by mid-November uh, on the process, and by then we will have all the public meetings uh, well completed. Uh, uh, one of the comments is that uh, then people understand that this meeting is being transcribed, that yes, this is true. Uh, the transcription will also be made publicly available uh, on our website. And so you can go back and, and review it if you certainly choose to. Uh, all our public meetings are going to be transcribed, and so uh, they will also be set up on uh, on the website. Let's see here. Right, Bruce, Bruce, they'll be available in our Adams electronic document system when that's concluded. Right. Yes. Okay. Uh, let's see. One of the questions is, is what powers or authorities do CABs have? Uh, I think you're going to have to look at the charters to find out what, they're, what they are authorized to do and not authorized to do. Uh, as is by the name, advisory panel or advisory board, they are there to provide advice and to who they serve uh, could be either feedback for the state to the government agencies could be for the local community. It depends on the charter and what it actually says. Um, let's see here. One of the questions here, is it possible for a licensee to complete decommissioning, terminate the license, but still have the site in a restricted use status? Um, I can tell you that we have regulations for restricted use uh, to date. Uh, we have uh, regulated and overseen uh, over 80 complex decommissioning sites, including 10 nuclear power plants, and all of those have been, re have been released for unrestricted use. And so while we have regulations for that particular condition, uh, none of the plant no, no facilities have been left behind uh, with restricted conditions. Uh, for after completing decommissioning. They have all met the dose criteria and uh, have met that criteria. I will point out to you, though, that seven of those 10 power plants that have been shut down still have dry fuel storage facilities which are under license. And so there are certain restrictions with that uh, particular piece of property in the immediate vicinity with it, but that's still under license. And that will be obviously decommissioned at a future date when the fuel is removed uh, from the site. But Matt, Neil, you want to go to the phone? Sure. Uh, operator, if you could uh, once again provide us with one of the uh, questions from a caller. Well, Neil, I don't hear any uh, operator. operator. Uh, we can go a few more of these uh, written questions if we choose. Yes, I'm yeah, sorry. I do apologize. Oh, I was go. grabbing the name. Go ahead. No, operator, please go ahead. We'll take another call. Okay, I was grabbing the name for you. Um, Donna Gilmore is the next question. Donna, your line is open, and you may ask your question. Uh, yeah, I've had a couple of questions. Uh, um, I've been to both the Diablo Canyon uh, cab and the San Onofre, and um, 
the having the light having the licensee run it uh, makes for a very one-sided operation i would encourage people to have a state operation maybe you can get the uh, uh licensee to, to fund that um and w one of the differences is if you could have the moderator just be a moderator and not a pontificator we have david victor here at san onofre who uh, basically cuts people off and sets unreasonable rules. We're at Diablo Canyon. They have a moderator that just does that, keeps everything going. Uh, a huge, huge difference. We refer to the San Onofre Community Engagement Panel as the Community Enragement Panel. Um, so that's some feedback. And I'd like to know, is it possible to delegate some authority from the MRC to the state so they can actually, um, uh, you know, enforce some higher uh, sta safety standards? Or is that, would that require a law change? Do you know? Could you could you clarify that a little bit, Ms. Gilmore, about what, what you mean by higher standards? Okay. Well, I saw higher, higher safety standards. Uh, you know, I know that I know the NRC can delegate some authority to the states for other radiological issues. Could they do the same thing for decommissioning? Could do you legally have the authority to delegate some safety enforcement and and allow the states to have maybe even a higher minimum standards? Is that something you can legally do? Well, uh, state standards have to be at least on a par with federal standards. But I'll let Bruce pr provide some additional details. Um, I, I, in general, we do not delegate the, the inventory responsibilities for Part 50 licenses, which is what the nuclear power plants are, uh, are licensed to. Uh, in general, though, I can tell you that there has been agreement made between the licensees and the, some of the power plants to lower some of the dose standards in which the site will be decommissioned. If I remember correctly, uh, May Yankee was uh, had agreed to a, a 10 millirem standard uh, at, at the main Yankee decommissioning, uh, which is well below which is below our uh, regulatory standard, but yet we weren't part of that negotiation. Uh, so, uh, but we can't delegate that authority as as long as the 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 requirements either meet or or more or ex be exceed or better than our standards. That's uh, it's up to the state to. Uh, uh, then we're fine with it, okay? Is that what so you were trying to state, get at, Ms. Gilmore? State, if, the, if, if the state wanted to have a higher standard on something, you wouldn't object to that? Are you re referring to radi radiological safety standards? One of my concerns is the, well, one of the things is you allow, you allow the destruction of the spent fuel pools for decommissioning even though the waste is still there and there's no other option uh, to recanisterize the waste. Um, so, and uh, right now you give exemptions that allow the pool to be destroyed even though there's no other option for that. So we're right. sitting here without a plan B. If the, if the state wanted, you know, would you support a state that wanted to keep the pools? If, if we supported that, then they would not be able to, to decommission the plant and terminate that part of the license. So uh, that, that would be up to the utility on how they want to maintain the facility into the future. Obviously, the uh, NRC regulations would require them to complete the decommissioning within 60 years. So it truly really would be up to them. Uh, as far as the state wanting to uh, in place additional requirements on uh, the licensee, uh, I don't think we would uh, necessarily uh, agree with that, uh, especially at least in this forum where we wouldn't know the specifics of it uh, in order to uh, make a comment on it either way. So and, thank and you we, for your comments. Yeah, we, we would just point out that there, we should, the public should not be left with the impression that without the spent fuel pool, there's, absolute, there's nothing that can be done if a, a problem develops with a, a dry cast. They, they could use a hot cell. They've other, other approaches well, there, are, there are no hot cells in the country large enough to replace canisters. The Testeria North Hot Cell in Idaho National Lab that was used for the cast store inspection, that was destroyed in 2007. The existing hot cell at, 
at Idaho is, is not designed for that. It's way too small, and there are no other hot cells. So we have a leaking but, but, canister at San Onofre. We're, we're basically, what's your plan? Let me, let, let me, let me clarify. A, a, a portable, I was referring more to a portable hot cell with a larger cask into which a damaged cast be placed. But we're, we're getting a little off track right uh, well, now. Just, so. just, to, just to, to respond, let me just respond to that. I know there's other people. Okay. Uh, there's a transcript where Riva uh, uh, told the Nuclear Technical Review Board they determined a portable hot cell is not feasible for this purpose. So uh, you might want to get some updated information that you're relying on. And I can provide the evidence if you need it. I, I appreciate okay, the thank comment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Neil, operator, um, yep. Go ahead, Bruce. I was, I was going to go to a couple of the written ones just to make sure okay. we got them in. Uh, the question is, is the NRC ultimately planning to create regulations for cabs, roles, functions, powers, and com composition, or will this remain within the local purview? Uh, as, I, as I said in the presentation, uh, we do not uh, have the authority to require uh, the creation of a citizen's advisory board or any other local uh, established community group uh, within the Atomic Energy Act. So uh, we, we can't even, we would not be able to create regulations to that fact unless the Congress gave us that authority. Uh, let's see, the next question is, who tracks abnormal events during DECON and would the CAB be made aware of the events? Uh, what type of, of records does the CAB have access to? Well, let me uh, just go back to our inspection program. Our inspection program is uh, very transparent unless it's associated with uh, security or, uh, or safeguards information. Uh, so therefore, all inspection reports uh, are publicly available. Uh, so the CAB has access to that, to any of the licensees' activities uh, associated with the inspection program. Uh, I want to reiterate that the inspection program continues uh, throughout the decommissioning process and that the, uh, the plant continues to be inspected until the license is terminated, which means that the licensee has demonstrated to us that the uh, uh, site meets the radiological criteria for license termination. So in addition to uh, inspections, inspection reports, uh, such things as any uh, events, that happen on site, those are also publicly available. And uh, so the public will have access to all those types of records. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's see. Can there be, can decommissioning funds be used to establish and support CABs? Uh, it's a good question. I really don't have an answer. Uh, since they're sponsored by the states or by the utilities, uh, I'm not sure. I know that the ones that are sponsored outside the uh, by the states are definitely not using decommissioning funds. The trust funds for a decommissioning plant are in a separate bank uh, trust and are only to be used for decommissioning uh, activities at the site. Uh, let's see here. Are there any more, ladies? Can there be more than one cab for the same site that represent different jurisdictions, such as the one for the state and one for the local community? Uh, I'm going to have to answer that with, uh, I guess, there could be. Uh, we don't regulate them. Uh, we don't sponsor them. And it would be up to the local community to have more than one uh, citizens advisory group uh, whether they have differing opinions or, or whatever is the case for the reason for the differing groups. So the answer to that is I guess there could be more than one. You ready to go back to the uh, phone? Yeah, let's, let's go back to the phone. Operator, if you could give us another caller, please. Yes, the next question comes from Barbara Warren. Barbara, your line is open and you may ask your question. Oh, thank you. Uh, yes, um, I have two questions. One, is there going to be you know, I'm a little confused about the, the public process with NRC. Is there going to be like a, um, a federal register notice and an opportunity to comment on your whole program, or are we just commenting on the, those questionnaires that you uh, presented to us? 
Well, I think uh, we will be publishing a number of Federal Register notices for the and, and meeting notices for the public meetings. Uh, we have the website where you can provide any comments you want. Uh, we specifically tailored this question out, questionnaire, which will be coming out uh, hopefully early next week, uh, to kind of tailor the types of questions we need that we think need to be in the report. However, people are welcome to provide whatever comments on the process or the, the citizen community advisory panels uh, as a whole uh, through our website if they choose to. We also have the NEMA resource uh, yeah. email. Yeah. Yeah, and, and we're we're getting the, that, uh, that uh, website to, to go to. Will, will you be notifying us about that? The website's already available. It was in the slides. And, oh, okay. uh, so I'll look at that. Okay. Yes. And also there's a, uh, an email address where you can send comments directly. Oh, okay. right. And you can find that webpage just by doing a search on our website for NEMA, N-E-I-M-A, will take you to that webpage. Okay, good. So then, then I do have an, another question that's important. What about what about sites that have other risks? In other words, that there there are existing risks um, at the site uh, that that are just happen to be there for a particular nuclear plant. For example, earthquake risk. And and I am sp speaking specifically of a plant that was never really analyzed for earthquake risk when it was originally permitted? Well, the plants were, were constructed and were designed and construction, constructed based on the, I guess, the hazards, such as the seismic the, uh, hazards and risks for the area. And so... Uh, no, I'm you know, saying the that they didn't know about the earthquake risk, risk until after the plant was built. Well, I'm sure that that, that would be an, analyzed uh, as part of our ongoing oversight of that particular facility. Yeah, and if I could, if I could just add, Bruce, after Fukushima, the two of the areas that we really focused in on were seismic and flooding risk. And so uh, the, the plants were all required to take a fresh look at any earthquake risk they might have. And for those plants that were at a higher risk, uh, we, we, we certainly paid closer attention. So would that come into play for the decommissioning? In other words, it would still be on your radar screen? Risks like that, would they still be on your radar screen during the decommissioning process? Uh, the answer would be yes. However, the, the uh, actual safety risks are reduced uh, because the, fuel's no, the plant is no longer operating. The fuel has been removed from the uh, reactor itself and placed in a, in, a, in a safe condition where you can't have an ac a reactor accident. So those considerations are taken into a, a account. I know at one plant in the northeast, uh, north Midwest, excuse me, we had uh, continued issues with flooding, and uh, there's still one in, another one in the Midwest. We have issues with flooding uh, that we continue to, to make sure the, the site implements the proper uh, mitigation uh, actions to prevent the plant from flooding. I, I think the most common thing would be that the spent fuel pool is still being used and loaded with fuel, and that's going to take some time for that to be moved out. So that's it's right. probably the most common problem that you're going to find. So would, would that be yeah. something you'd be looking at as part of decommissioning? If there's like an earthquake risk, for example?